Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 86. This episode is Harley Durst, who is the coolest. He's uh, he's another creature performer. He uh, he played Moloch in Solo, but he's done a whole lot of other cool stuff. Uh, we talk about how he actually grew up doing capoeira. Capoeira. Got to roll the R there. Uh, and he actually went to Brazil and did it, which is really cool because you get to go to where it's from. You know, so that was pretty neat. He talks about uh, being from Australia and then moving to the UK to work on Wonder Woman. Uh, right? I know. Crazy. And then he just happens to be, I don't know, maybe Loki's stunt double from uh, Thor Ragnarok. I mean, what? This one dude doing all this stuff. Uh, so we talk about different stunts that he's done, how he became a stuntman, which was super fascinating. Uh, we talk about I, Frankenstein, which he played like this demon lord in, which was super cool because he got to fight Aaron Eckhart. Um, he's got great stories about that. Uh, we talk about the harness that he uses and different uh, stunt tricks that they do in the movies. Fascinating. Fascinating stuff. Really, really cool. Uh, we go into his time in uh, King Kong the Musical, and now he's actually the voice of Kong. What? I know. I know. Uh, yeah, and then we, we go really into uh, his work on Solo, a uh, Star Wars story, the different characters that he played, a really funny story about the test fit for Moloch, um, and just ton- tons of cool stuff. Harley's the best. This was super fun. So without further ado, here is the interesting podcast, episode number 86 with Harley Durst. Theme song time. Yeah, it must be difficult doing uh, interviews with people on the other side. Yeah, it's uh, it's fun. It's fun because Florida's like, I have a lot of guests that are in California, and then I have a lot of guests that are in London, and I'm right in the middle of both. So you've got like right. three hours behind for California, five hours ahead for London, and I'm stuck in the middle with you. Yeah, 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 bang it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. It's good. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad to finally meet you and get to talk, you know. Half of podcasting is scheduling. That's kind yeah, of yeah, no doubt. Jeez, I bet I've had guests on before that it took almost a year actually back and forth. Oh wow! Yeah, with like <laughs> agents and managers and stuff, and you know how it gets. You know how it gets. Yeah, absolutely. Trying to juggle around to work and family and everything else. I know, I know, and everyone's so busy too. That's the other thing. I'm like, hey man, you want to chat? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, okay, you have eight things going on. Let's see if we can figure this out. You know, yeah. Last thing you want to be is inconvenient. But yeah. that's good. That's good. I know you're staying busy, doing doing cool yeah. stuff. You know. Yeah, yeah. It has been really cool. It's um, there's so much work over here in the UK at the moment. Sure. Sure. And, um, Big yeah, resurgence. Came out. Yeah, absolutely. And then you it's, got uh, Pinewood. You know, killing. Yeah. It. Killing. Yeah, it. and they're they're expanding all of their land and building more studios. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Mm. I mean, there's so many big things. Cause that's the other thing is like everyone thinks of. You know, like California and like Vancouver now and Atlanta as like a hub for movies and stuff like that. But London's like its own sort of powerhouse as well. Like when you think of all the yeah. crazy stuff that like Star Wars, James Bond, like even Wonder Woman was up there. Yeah. Wink, wink. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's some big stuff happening in London. So it's cool that there's there's an expanding market for stuff like that. And then we get to see yeah. people like you. You know, hey, it all kind of works out. Are you from London? No, no, from Australia. So, um, what? Oh, yeah, yeah. I spent the last uh, 10, 10 years in Melbourne. Um, but really, uh, yeah. And then I came over here for the first Wonder Woman in 2015, moved over here with my family. Wow. That's yeah. very far. <laughs> that's, the, that's the other yeah, side yeah, of the yeah. planet. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, um, we got asked to to work on it, and my wife got audition was asked to also audition for it. Oh, right on! And then we had a yeah, we had a little four year old at the time, so we all came over, and was expecting to be on it for about two or three months, and then ten months later, we're still working on it. <laughs> 
and uh, decided that there was yeah, so much work we should we should stay over here and just keep it rolling. Why not? You know, what is it? Make hay mm. while the sun's shining or something like that? Yeah, know. absolutely. But Australia. Yeah. yeah. Did you do like movie work in Australia? Or are you just like, yeah, that's where to be? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've been uh, stunts in Australia for over 10 years. And then, um, dude. Yeah, it was, it was a busy time in Australia. It was nice. Like it was just starting to really pick up. And then I've got the phone call to a chance to work on Wonder Woman. I didn't want to pass that up. Sure. And, you know, and then, I was able to go back to Australia for a few months, and I did saw Ragnarok. Yeah, and you did. That was, yeah, that was pretty amazing. Being up on the Gold Coast in Queensland during winter, you can still swim in the ocean. There you go. You're in the sunshine, <laughs> yeah, living by the beach, and made me miss Australia a whole lot. But you know, if there would be a film like that once a year in Australia. Sure. Maybe sure. two films like that a year, and there's a you know a large pool of talent in the stunt industry that everyone's trying to get on there mm -hmm. so if you're not in that top percentage that's always working sure it's very very difficult yeah and you know you come into london and then every studio would have like three or four films like that in a year yeah yeah so there's Man. a lot more work on over here i had no idea you're from australia look at that mm. so yeah so it was couldn't, like you couldn't tell from my funny accent i mean there's so many accents out there, you know. That's right. That's what's really funny is when you talk to people who have an accent, and it's like everyone has an accent. It's just different. So, like, for you, yeah. I have an accent. But to me, I'm like, no, nah, no, right. I don't. Yeah, yeah. Language is yeah. really funny. So, so wait, we're, mm. so you were stunts first. Did you always yes. want to get into stunts, or you always wanted to get into acting? Like, when did, when did you were like, I want to be in movies? Yeah, well, I was uh... – grew up in just a little country town so there's like limited opportunities and i was like into rollerblading and i discovered capoeira and i was like wanted to do all these crazy things and yeah uh yeah my parents wanted me to roll in university even though they hadn't been to university themselves it was like <laughs> the avenue they wanted to take sure and uh yeah so i don't it's one of those things like it kind of finds you like your passion you just sort of have it yeah. in the background but i was um i was backpacking through Part of part of Europe went Portugal, Spain, and then I went to Brazil for three months doing capoeira over there with some guys. What? Yeah, and I took a year off study, and funds were running low. I'd been there for over three months, and then I got an email from my mum saying she'd enrolled me in university back home in Australia, <laughs> so I better come back. I was like, "How the hell did you do that?" <laughs> yeah, I'm not even there. Who signed yeah, this that's thing? Right. <laughs> yeah, so. It came at a good time and it gave me something to do. So I came back to Australia and did media production and communications at university and met, yeah, met some postgraduates on there that had funding to do a feature and it was had a bit of fighting in it. There you go. And I was, yeah, teaching couple at the university at the time. So they asked me to come on board and uh, do a little fight sequence. And then I actually met a professional stunt guy and I was like, oh, wow, you can do this yeah. for real. So uh, that's kind of what kicked it all off. That's yeah. so cool. Man, yeah. I don't think I know anyone who's doing capoeira. It's like the coolest spin kicks, dance fighting, right? Brazilian dance fighting. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. That's Absolutely. So cool. Was that, did you stumble, yeah. Did you just stumble into that too? You're like, hold on, meet the followers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, it must have been like 94 or something. There was a film called Only the Strong oh, with Mark Picascos. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think that probably kickstarted a cup later for a lot of people. Fair, fair. Do you know, yeah. do you know a guy named Latif Crowder? He, yes. He's one that, like, I, around, like, let's see, it would have been 05, 06, like, around the time YouTube started, you know? Yeah, There were a yeah. lot of those videos that were just random fight scenes that people made and whatever, and Latif mm -hmm. Crowder was the one who was like, what is that guy doing? And that's how yeah, I was like, was oh, it's Capoeira. And he's, like, jumping 15 feet in the air. I was like, what is happening? There's superheroes among us. Yeah, that's nuts. and you did it in Brazil. Was that cool? That's where it's from. I mean, yeah, that's right. And that level. was like that was yeah, that was two thousand, the year two thousand. Oh, two thousand one. It was actually just after nine eleven. Oh, well. But um, yeah, that was yeah. There was email back then. There wasn't social media and as such. Like it was sure. yeah. So it was pretty amazing. Did you go yeah. Pete? No, no. It was just like traditional street cup weather. Right on. Like, Have yeah. you ever been kicked in the head? Be honest oh, with me, Harley. Yeah. yeah, come on. <laughs> <laughs> this beautiful face, come on. Yeah. That's why, <laughs> like, you know, it doesn't look yeah, like yeah. you took a few hits. <laughs> no, that, that's why I always do creature work. They cover yeah. me up. 
<laughs> tired of getting kicked in the head. <laughs> mm. That's yeah, like that an old car. Momentum. It needs panel beating. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. You get enough speed, you turn into Sonic the Hedgehog, just flipping everywhere. <laughs> that's yeah. so funny. That's that's something you got to be really flexible for. Capoeira is yeah. really nuts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm 39 this year and no, started Capoeira when I was 16. Dude. So, yeah. And then, you know, every now and then I get hired for a memory of somebody has of me 10 years ago. Oh, and you're yeah. like, whoa, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know Capoeira guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, like the mind is willing and the body's not always able. Like there's still a lot of things it can do, but just the repetitive and the flexibility. Sure, yeah. sure. You haven't kicked anyone in the head recently is what you're saying. No, I haven't, thankfully. Yeah, probably best, probably best. Yeah. That's so funny. Is it so you've done capoeira in Australia, in Europe, in Brazil. Yeah. Is there... I've never been to Brazil, so I'm like genuinely curious. Is there like a capoeira culture thing down there, like there is with jujitsu and stuff? Like when you oh, do yeah. that it, kind of thing? Yeah, it's huge. Like there's capoeira at all levels. Like I said, the capoeira at the street level, and mm-hmm. like, you know, the poor people do it, and there's academies. And surprisingly, I mean, maybe not so surprisingly, like capoeira is everywhere. And we went to Bahia, which is uh, like sort of the birthplace of capoeira, where a lot of the African slaves came into the country. Sure. And you see the best and the absolute worst of capoeira in, oh. you know, all the colors of the rainbow there. It's like the music can be amazing. The music can be terrible. It can be super aggressive. Oh, people you're right. I forgot. In, in clubs or on the music. street. Yeah, like, yeah, that's right. So, like, you get the best and the worst of everything. Sure, sure. Mm. Man. So capoeira was your, was your entrance to stunts. That's pretty cool. It's yeah, like, you know, yeah, actual that's... something. Because uh, I had yeah. a guy on recently, his name's V-Dan. He's in the Jackie yeah. Chan t- stunt team and stuff. And he was saying that he did wushu like his entire life and he competed and everything. But then when he got to work on Skyfall, he's like, I had this whole thing. And then he goes, these guys have been doing like Brazilian jiu-jitsu and all this other stuff. And they're just punching me in the head. And I'm like, what is happening? Because it was more mm. of a performance thing with wushu versus yes. like practical application. So that's kind of yeah. that's kind of neat. I just... Yeah. Just, it still blows my mind that you started in Australia and then in like other side of the planet. Let's do that. That's pretty yeah, serious. Just go man. where the work takes you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That also shows how bad you want it though. I'm I'm a firm yeah. believer that if there's something that you really want, like you kinda have to almost prove to the universe how bad you want it. It's like, okay, well the work is in London. That's a big deal to go had you been yeah. to London before? Yeah, I had been uh backpacking and then uh Traveling with my with my wife, then my girlfriend, fiance. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think that's so true. Like for me, it's just victory through persistence. Yep. You know, just yep. keep chasing the dream. Like I think that's a really important thing. Um, yeah, because it's not something that I would would plan. But thankfully, um, my wife is half French. She's got family in France, so we can be close to their family as well. Cool. So she's loving living and working over here as well or she's studying at the moment um yeah sure it, it, yeah and I, I guess it's a, it's a great industry to be in for that because now that i've got kids i need to be based somewhere so like it's great being based in london because there's so much work so in australia i had to travel around quite a bit and be away but here i can be close to four or five huge studios yeah that's and right. there's a lot of work around yeah and you know you're killing it so that kind of helps too you know? <laughs> yeah, it's good. <laughs> Man. So when you're doing stunts, I'm fascinated. So first off, how many times have you been set on fire? <laughs> well, well, I've never actually done a job being set on fire. We've done <laughs> like training and done my own personal stuff, but I've never been paid for yeah, being set on fire. In my personal time, all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've had to like blast through some explosions. And uh, there was actually um, the scene in, in Solo – Yes. playing Moloch, yeah, in the speeder. Like, they had that speeder crashing through some explosions and they had a gimbal set up on, on the sound stage, and they were, like, shooting fireballs at, at myself and what? the speeder. <laughs> You're like, this and is that, nothing. <laughs> no, well, that yeah, I mean, that was something. Like, I rocked up on set not realizing I'd be close to fire or, like, having fireballs shot at me, <laughs> and they hadn't flame-checked the costume. Oh no! <laughs> and the thing is, with that costume, the that grey shiny kind of, or you know, parts of it dull, parts of it shiny, that that 
grey on the outside of the costume is actually wax. It's paraffin wax. It's candle wax. Oh, no. Which is very flammable. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we had to do some, like, some tests with the the mask and, and the, the robe sitting inside the cockpit while they shot the flame bars and debris past it to see what it would do. Yeah. It would catch fire. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's so funny. They're like, it's Harley. Don't worry about it. In a spare yeah, yeah, time, right. he lights himself on fire. We can throw fireballs at him. It's cool. That's right. Yeah. That's so funny. And you said it was Wonder Woman that was, like, the big made you travel across the planet? Mm. That's yeah, that's what we we packed up the things, only expecting to be for three months and then and moved over here and it just kept on going and going and going. And, yeah, that's what good. Uh, uprooted us, yeah. I mean, fair. It's Wonder Woman. You, got, you were Aries in that, if I'm not mistaken. You got yeah, the, that's right. That's pretty good. Did you get to wear the armor and stuff like that? No, there was a um, an incarnation of the final fight was Wonder Woman and Aries that was quite different. And we had this whole um, fight sequence previews planned out and Ares would be growing, sort of absorbing Wonder Woman's anger and getting larger and larger and larger. Yeah. And it was a lot more of a, a sword fight confrontation battle uh, as opposed to the sort of like forcing objects across and trying to smash her. Sure, sure. Um, and then that all ended up getting changed in the edit and cut and turned into to sort of what we see it. Sure, sure. What we see now. Yeah. It's still pretty cool though. Oh yeah, it was great. <laughs> big, you got I mean, Wonder Woman. Come on, man. Come on. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. And Yeah, it was if, one of those films working on it that we thought it was going to be something special. Like it was it was impressive what we shot in Italy, that beach sequence with yeah. the Germans attacking the Amazonians, like seeing playback of that and, and what was being captured was pretty cool. I bet. I bet. And that's not, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, that's not the only superhero movie you've worked on. Uh, we did, uh, I did Thor Ragnarok straight after. You Wonder did? Wonder. You did? Yeah, and Yeah, so that that was pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. What did you do yeah, on that? Playing, uh, I was doubling for Tom Hiddleston as Loki. You did? I mean, yeah. you realize what you just said. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, just kind of, there's a guy in Thor, it's, you probably don't know him. It's doubling for Loki. What? Yeah. Yeah, that's that so was cool. A, that was really cool. So when I know in the cuts, so when you're doing like an action sequence, you've got like the main actors are doing you know the face stuff and whatever. But then when they're getting thrown through walls and doing the actual like hard stuff, that's when you step in. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, there is more to it than that. Like that's what we basically end up seeing on the screen. But we previs and conceive the whole fight sequence and what Loki oh. would do. Right, so, it's rehearsals so and stuff, a, and how. Yeah, and that that could run for three three or four months before the film even starts. Dude. And that could be a month or two months even before we meet the actors and and start training them and doing that. So there's quite a long process. That makes sense. As a part of that, yeah. Man, no, I, yeah, I never put two and two together because it's very much like a stand-in. Which is yeah. essentially what a stunt double is. It's a stand-in that gets kicked around. <laughs> it's like yeah, yeah, that's right. And like, it's great room. working. Yeah, working with a, an actor like Tom. He's super physical. I actually didn't realize he would be so physical and so capable. Like, he's uh, I find it with a lot of actors, their their memory is great, and you know they treat it as, as a character-driven thing. It's just not a physical movement. So they've got their own style and in uh, you know thing that they, they they put in all of their moves. So they, mem- they like, remember the choreography. Like, they really? ask you questions why they're doing the movement like this. They give it reason and motivation. And there's a lot of times where the, the actor will perform better than the stunt performers around him, you know, because of that. And it's, it should be no surprise, but sure. Tom, was, Tom was great because he was super coordinated. He was strong. He understood his character. Mm-hmm. And um, he had a lot of um, opinion on how he would use the weapons and which type of weapons he wanted to use and what he would do, what he wouldn't do. So that was really cool working with him to develop that. And he did pretty much all the fights that we see, you know, on, on screen. You know, there was what? the sort of flipping uh, 360 roll that we did in one um, where myself did that. But the rest of that on screen, most of it is Tom, to That's his so credit. Cool. That's always yeah. good to hear when you've got like, I feel like when you're watching a movie and when the 
people behind the character also love the character. It just kind of, yeah. as a fan, you like it even more. You're like, oh, they care yeah. too. So that's yeah. cool that he's like, even down to the way that they move. So you kind of like yeah. collaborated to what the physical presence of Loki is. That's kind of yeah, neat. That, uh, yeah, absolutely. It's the only way to make it really work. And like, you know, like Tom Hill. Wilson is Loki. You can't take that away from him. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's like Hugh Jackman well, well, as Wolverine. Yeah, wink, he's, wink, hey, wink. <laughs> you're, you're good at this. I mean, you're really good at this. Come on. I'm trying to impress you, Harley. Is it working? <laughs> <laughs> You've done your research. <laughs> I mean, maybe I'm a fan. I don't know. Who's asking? You know. <laughs> yeah. What What was What was also really fun on Thor is that I got to play Thor just for one day. What? Did you did you get yeah. the hammer? No, I didn't. Uh, well, yeah. That's okay. Get, it still yeah, counts. Yeah. He didn't have a hammer for a while, you know. <laughs> what, yeah, what was really cool about it for me, like I was like vegan for two years at the time, so it was vegan Thor, which is pretty oh. funny. Cause I got like tiny little arms <laughs> compared to like Chris Hemsworth. They're like, oh, don't worry, you know, we need the skill set, so like we'll CGI bigger arms on you. There you go. <laughs> and. Yeah, two two of the the previous stunt performers had both injured themselves doing a running sun, front somersault oh, no. um, up down some stairs. Oh, so it's where oh, no. it's where Thor is getting chased by Hulk through the car, and they're going down to yes. the spaceship. Uh huh. Just after Thor jumps out of um, the Hulk's apartment, oh no, bounds <laughs> down and then charges through the car. So all of that made it through into the behind the scenes, but it didn't make it into the cinema release, unfortunately. Sure. Yeah, so they they got the main um, stunt performer from two angles doing the front somersault down the stairs. It looked amazing, but they just needed one more from the side profile and from behind. Mm -hmm. So then that's where I stepped in and did that for a day. But that there you the go. reason why for me the reason why that was so cool for me was watching Star Wars as a kid and watching Luke train with Yoda and seeing him running through Dagobah yes. and do the front somersault. I always thought, that was, oh, man, front somersault was like a it's hero. That's cool. such a cool yeah. thing to do. Yeah, yeah. So I was kind of, you know, real, well, yeah, reliving childhood fantasies. Yeah, as Thor. As a superhero, yeah. <laughs> Dude. This vegan wasn't like, Thor. Yeah, vegan Thor. <laughs> That's awesome. You got to do both. So yeah, so you get to wear the costumes, right? When you're a stunt double, because yeah. they got a yeah, absolutely, yeah, fully dressed up, the hair and all. Dude, yeah, was it awesome? What's your it was awesome. What's your favorite costume you've worn? It's definitely not Moloch. Yeah, yeah. that thing was hard. <laughs> Damn. I bet. I bet. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually really loved uh, Loki's costume. It was pretty amazing. Yeah, that, that just felt yeah, it felt cool. And when you and like, so so well made. Yeah. Like, it's all, yeah. They spare no expense for that. It's yeah, the tailoring was amazing. Sure. And when you move around, you got yeah. that sweet jacket, so you get to be like Neo from the Matrix. Yeah, this that was I cool to do that double. like dive roll thing in it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was cool. I'd be that stunt guy that's like, check this out, fa, 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 fa. just flip it. Oh, sorry, we got yeah. a fire. Sure, let's let's do it. That's that was a really great thing with Tom, actually, because like the crown changed in Ragnarok, right? Like it wasn't right. a full helmet with the horns; it was a crown with the horns. And we were playing around with that, and we had this very light carbon fiber version that stayed on the head really, really well, except for some reactions; it would kind of shift and things. But we thought Tom would totally dig it because, like, it's kind of light; it looks cool. Yeah. And he said to me even before he saw the helmet, he's like. Oh my God, we're not fighting in the helmet army. I was like, Oh yeah, we actually are. I've got this like carbon fiber one. And, you know, he's like, Ah, oh, oh boy. I, I think I think we need to lose the helmet. Sure. And I was like, No, it's going to be cool. But then <laughs> this iteration came in where we actually peeling the helmet off the head, and he was using it as a weapon, right? Because he's got the big horn. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, you actually I can't remember how much of that you see, but you see him holding it in his hand as his killing for one of the last uh, sort of demons on the bridge. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, like, that was a that was a really cool sort of input that Tom had for that. Yeah. And then, you know, you've got to find out how we fight with sure. horns and a helmet, that kind of thing. Yeah. Man, so you've even got, like, because I know, like, Neil Scanlon's team, you've got, like, months' worth of R&D beforehand. I'd never yes. put two and two together that stunts would be the exact same way because you don't just want to wing it the day of. You know, yeah, not totally. Man, I never thought about that. That's yeah. pretty cool. 
So, yeah, yeah. To be be a part of that, so a little bit of creativity. We had an amazing fight choreographer on Thor Ragnarok, who's um, John Valera, who's also like a hero of mine because he was one of the first kind of XMA guys that hit YouTube and yeah. doing you know this amazing martial arts and super tight, super sharp. So like, I got to work with him on the second Wolverine as well. There so it yeah, so it was nice to have that relationship. Sure. You know, sort of. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So. On so for stunt stunt guys, right? I see a lot of uh, like I follow a guy named Matt Sterling. You probably, he's yeah great. So he posts a lot of like stunt videos and whatnot. And it seems like a really common thing with stunt people is when they're like running and then they jerk them back and they fall from explosions or whatever. Like, have you sustained any injuries as a stunt man? Because I feel like there's two there's two ways of thought. There's one that's like nope. Not a single one. And then there's like, oh, God, yeah. They're like missing fingers, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I've been lucky enough not to have any major injuries. There it is. See? See? It's like a, it's got to be a yeah, point of pride, I, you know? You're like, I've been yeah, thrown I, I've through windows. Def- <laughs> it, yeah, I, I categorize it uh, two different categories. It's like getting paid to do stunts and then training. I've hurt myself in training <laughs> worse than I have when I'm getting paid. Fair. So like my professional record's pretty clean. I like <laughs> it. My training record is, yeah. That's fair, because in your in, yeah. your in your training, you're lighting yourself on fire. So you've, you're setting the bar pretty high for your training. That's right. When so, you get to work, it's easy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Fireballs, you mean not continue? Sure. Yeah. By all means. Fireballs yeah. are breakfast. <laughs> That's, That's right. so funny. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. So, like, so like, what kind of training do you have to do to be a stuntman? Are you just like falling all over the place and just like flipping through? Are you a Power Ranger in your spare time? Talk to oh, me early. come on, come on. We're not superheroes. <laughs> oh, I'm a dad. I, I I'm a dad. I'm a dad of two little girls. That two makes you a girls. superhero. <laughs> That's right. Hey, to them it does. Look Boom. at that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I dropped the mic, but it'd be loud. <laughs> so, yeah, I was lucky enough to um, be in partnership, and we owned a, a warehouse in Melbourne in Australia, and uh, we ran that for seven years. And uh, wow. we, yeah, I was – we were teaching Capoeira. Oh, sorry, we were teaching parkour and stunts Sweet. out of it. Yeah, so I sort of started doing uh, parkour around to uh, 2004, I guess. And um, there was not a lot going on in Australia or you know much around the world. It was kicking off obviously in France and in the UK. Sure. Um, the, parkour helped me the most with stunt work. You know, really? like yeah, it's the agility distancing Makes um sense. just strength sure you know mm-hmm. yeah all, all of that like cup weather is amazing in the acrobatics but in australia especially australian drama like we had a thing called blue healers we, we all know what neighbors is right yeah, yeah. so like you don't do cup weather in neighbors you know like there's no like <laughs> acrobatical stuff in neighbors sure um yeah and australian drama like there was uh, didn't really much fighting in that sense you know, at all in Australia um, until much later on. And sort of like, well, the Wolverine was cool, like the very first Wolverine, but the second Wolverine was like 2012, yep. playing ninjas yeah, on rooftops. Sweet little fighting, tuck and roll. Fighting Wolverine. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was bad art. <laughs> yeah, it was. Get a little yeah, bow and so, arrow cord. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like cup water and parkour is like a great avenue into stunt work. So sort of like got a lot of bases, bases covered. And um, I always try to just maintain those kind of interests. Like I actually don't have a gym membership. I train when I'm at work and then, you know, keep general fitness up with running and stuff like that. Sure. Um, but yeah, and practical skills, climbing and all that kind of thing works works really well for stunts. I bet. I bet. So I've seen a lot of like... I don't I don't I'm I don't know what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna call it rigging. <laughs> yeah, when, yeah, yeah. When you've got like people on wires and then you've got other oh, yeah. people that are like pulling it so they can like go places. How does yeah. that work? Because I've seen kind of videos and it blows my mind and I'm not I'm missing the middle part. Break this down for me. Yeah, so the 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 rigging is uh can either be a hand pull, which is people on the end of the or the other end of the line, mm-hmm. or it could be a ratchet or a ram. Um, so which is a pneumatic ram loaded up with pressure and then when they fire it the ram sucks in your lines attached to that so that's where you get sent flying oh. <laughs> yeah and they're they're pretty wild like you need to have 
a good rigging team, you need to have a lot of experience on the ram and, you know, like there's a lot of factors that go into play with that. And that was an interesting one that came up with Tom where I had gone away and done a rehearsal on location and the shot actually made it into the trailer for Thor Ragnarok, but it didn't make it into the film and it was the, the death scene of Odin. So oh, they yeah. changed all of that. So, yeah, that, that completely changed. But you see an overhead of Thor and Loki in a, an alleyway and Hela destroys Mjolnir, Thor's hammer, and Thor yes. and Loki go flying backwards. Mm. Yeah, so we did that live on, on two separate ratchets, shot oh. down a, an alleyway, and Thor gets blasted into a dumpster, or sort of chips off a dumpster and tumbles down the alleyway, and Loki just gets sent smashing into the, a breakaway dumpster and then hits the ground. Oh. And uh, I was pretty pumped because we did this in a couple of different variations and it was it was pretty badass. I was yeah. excited. And I, and I told Tom about it and the first thing he said is, I haven't been fit for a harness. I didn't know that I was doing a jerk back. Oh. I was like, oh, this oh, is no. actually, yeah, this is a pretty wild one. Like this is this is one that I, that I would be doing. And he said, but I could do it right. And <laughs> the answer is yes. Like he could do it. Yeah. But it's way above my pay grade to say or do anything like that. And spoke to the stunt coordinator he spoke to production and production are just like no way like this is too sure. wild like <laughs> sure. we can break harley yeah, yeah yeah we can't break tom sure <laughs> yeah and you know tom's cool he came to me and he's like just make it the wildest ratchet that you've done you yeah. know doing proud it's like hell yeah yeah we'll, you know, make this happen yeah what does it hurt does getting jerked back like that it's got a it can't feel good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Come on. I got to ask. <laughs> yeah, oh, and that's man. the thing, like, knowing knowing how to take impact, that just happens with time, you know, like. Sure. Yeah. It's like learning how to fall. That's, like, a really big thing. Repetition. Yeah. yeah. Repetition. <laughs> like, I'm really good at falling at this point. <laughs> <laughs> this point in my life. Yeah. Yeah, we'll You're see how long we can keep doing it. Professional fall. faller. That's the, yeah. That can be the new subtitle. Man. Yeah. So when you're doing like jerkbacks and stuff, like how is that harness? Is it just like your whole torso just kind of wrapped in a little wrap and then just? Because like, I'm yeah. sure there's got to be like weight distribution for that kind of that's shock. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. You're a lot smarter than you look. That's for <laughs> sure. Right. That is the first time I've heard that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna go on my yeah. book with your name next to it. Harley Dirk yes. said. <laughs> Yeah, there's some um, there's some specialty harness uh, manufacturers, and um, one of the main ones is Climbing Sutra, and they're based out of uh, Las Vegas. They do a lot for Cirque du Soleil. Oh, sweet. And yeah, yeah, it's a multi-point harness. Like the, uh, I should know this, but there's probably like 50 pick points on the harness. You've got wow. you know crutch straps that hold it down. It's sort of like cut over the shoulder, and we have that harness on underneath. Then we have our padding on. And then we'll put a shackle to that costume comes on and they have to cut a hole in the costume, sure. attach up to the line. And the interesting thing about that alleyway we did in Ragnarok is that, uh, you know, it's a serviceable alleyway and you can't oh, always no. have solid fixing points of where you want to rig and set the rams up. And, you know, they're blasting a lot of pressure, so it has to be solid. Sure. So the riggers actually had to set up a truss system inside of a window of a toilet what? <laughs> and put, put pressure on it against the wall so that it was going to be strong enough to hold. And it was just sort of creative thinking that sure. allows and innovative uh, allows those things to happen. And then the nice thing about the ram is that once the pressure and the stroke of the ram are dialed in, mm -hmm. then it's a button press every time and it's super consistent. Oh, that's good. Um, yeah, whereas with with people pulling on a line, you don't get as much power, and there can sometimes be inconsistencies. But sure. having said that, there's also lots of times when hand pulls are the best thing because it's cheap and easy and quick to set up, and you can play with the variation of it a lot easier. Sure. Yeah. That makes sense. All right, so how many costumes have you ruined doing stunts? <laughs> mm. <laughs> Too many to count. Yeah. There's always a love-hate relationship with costume and yeah. props, and you know they've got this amazing carbon fiber cord rubber sword, and you break it on the first take. And oh you're like, man! I get another one, and those things like they cost hundreds. You know, yep. the amount of man hours that go into making 
individual items like that, yeah. I think about that a lot when I see any sort of, like, weapon fighting. I was like, oh, man, what is that made out of? How often does it break? And how many times do people hit their hands? You know, like yeah. in a sword fight and you get knuckle bites? You're like, yeah. oh, that has to suck. Getting smashed real easy on the fingers? You're like, oh, man. That's yeah, cool. that was a big one. When we did uh, I Frankenstein, which is, oh, yes. I think that was 2012, mm-hmm. and I got to fight against Aaron Eckhart. And you did amazing, and... by the way. Thank you very much. <laughs> that, was, that was, as a like finished piece that made it onto film, I was pretty pleased that like, so much of that fight made it on there. Like a um, lot of it. Looked really cool, yeah. 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 He was really good. Like yeah, he got he to train. The coolest. With, he just trained so damn hard, it's scary. Like <laughs> when you're working with him, like you've got to up the ante. Like he sure. just brings it. And we had rehearsed with a different sort of a, a traditional like um kind of bamboo rattan stick that sure. just they just don't break easy. They're designed for constant smashing, but the design of those sticks they were supposed to be metal so they'd come up with this carbon fiber core they had a rubber outside and the sticks that he were using were like heavier than the sticks that i was using oh no <laughs> and on the first take he comes like charging down and they're all like long sequences and just by simply blocking his strike it was just breaking my weapon <laughs> yeah wait, wait a second hold on <laughs> yeah <laughs> And when you're doing that stick biting, it's called Kali. Your hands are really super exposed, so you've got to be really careful, like not to, especially yeah. an actor, you don't smash him across the knuckles. So, like, sure. that's where, that's where I leveled up as a stunt performer, fighting an actor. Like, there you go. Yeah, I might have accidentally teed off on the back of Aaron Eckhart's head once. <laughs> it was an accident, right? Wink, wink, yeah. wink, wink, wink. Man, he took it like a champion, but jeez. What you horrendous. You forgot that he like fought giant great white sharks that could think. Like, that's, that's not a man you want to mess with, Harley. <laughs> that's right, he's badass. He really is. So how long, was, in I Frankenstein, you were like done up. Prosthetics, like yes. you were this demon lord thing. How long did that take yeah. you to get on? Like, How long were you in the makeup chair? Uh, that's... In the morning, that's about a three and a half hour process. There you go. There you go. Yeah, and that had uh, lenses as well as teeth, so it's like difficult to see. Your ears are covered. It's difficult to hear. You've got a big bridge on the nose, yeah. so your depth perception gets messed up, and that's part of the reason why. Oh, that is the reason why I struck <laughs> on the back of the head instead of the back. <laughs> yeah. Man, yeah, I didn't realize that that was like lenses as opposed to like you know, contacts, like your eyes looking through. It was like a full head. Uh, So it is a full head, but it's contact lenses that you're wearing. And the, the, that design was like a cat's eye. And to make the cat's eye, they, they have to have a black shape right in the center of your vision. So the center of your vision is actually blurred. And then the outside of it is slightly better. Oh no. Which is weird. It's just weird. (laughs) And here's in low light. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Man. There was a there was a scene in that where we were fighting in a cathedral that they built on a set, and um, I was playing a hero demon, a different character but the same, uh, very similar lenses and setup, mm-hmm. and I got rushed on because they needed an actor who was Jai Courtney. That uh, amazing. Yeah, if you know Jai Courtney, oh, yeah. he did like another Bruce Australian Wilson's son. And, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, yep. yeah, he's yep. a beast. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's a beast. <laughs> Captain Boomerang. And I was, yeah, that, exactly. I was supposed to get front kicked by by him. Oh, and sweet. I've, I, yeah, I've come running up onto the set, and I've gone from a really brightly lit a prosthetic makeup studio at one end, and then go into the, into the sound stage, and it's so dark. It was like sure. sort of really dark. And I get guided up the stairs, and I get put in my place, and I'm looking around. I can't figure out who's standing in front of me. I can just sort of see shapes and darkness. <laughs> and the stunt coordinator came up to me and he's like, are you padded up on the on the front, on the stomach and the chest? I said, yeah, yeah. I said, you know, you've got to get kicked by Jai. I said, yeah. And he's like, all right. And he stood back and just the way that he stood back, I kind of looked at him like, what is he doing? And then he just front kicked me into the stomach <laughs> to see how I would react and take it. I had no idea it was coming. Oh, oh no. man. He nailed me. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> he's like... Oh, I th- he's like, I thought you said you were ready. I was yeah. like, oh, I just didn't know it was coming. <laughs> like, it'll be fine. With, it'll be fine on the day. Oh, yeah. my God. That's the most Australian story I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like getting front kicked by Captain Boomerang. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you said you were ready. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
I've heard what you do in your spare time. You can take a kick. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, that's so cool. And with that one, you're like, you're fighting. You've got your sticks. There's water on the ground. Like, that's yeah. a, that's a difficulty pretty high up there. And then they stuck you in a pin with Aaron Eckhart, which is uh, not not bad. Well done. Fri- frightening place to be. Frightening. Yeah. Frightening. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There, there was actually a couple of moves that uh, that were some of the most dangerous, coolest gags that I got to do in a film, and they got taken out of that fight. Oh, no. And, yeah, I was gutted. We shot it all on second unit with the action unit. Sure. And fighting against the stunt double, and then two weeks later we came back to it on main unit with the director and uh, uh, and Aaron, and um, they showed me the rough cut. And then we had to figure out how we piece the cuts together and get the inserts that they need. And, and there's two really badass gags weren't in there. Ah, that's me like, though, man, isn't it? Yeah. That's the worst part. I learned, yeah, I learned a lesson. Like, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's you got to kill your baby sometimes. You've got to just like. That's right. That's right. Yeah, like you've got to let that thing go and, and just pick it up and, and, and move on. Yeah. But like, mm. And they were, they were pretty dangerous stunts as well. And that sort of surprised me. It's like, why did we go through that all that effort, <laughs> yeah. put our like, lives in danger? Sure. Well, like, I almost died them, with was, this one. <laughs> yeah, well, one of them I was getting suplexed onto concrete. The suplex is that oh. like, wrestling movie. Yeah, you yeah. got them from behind around the waist. Boom. Oh, man. And we were on the second level of this abandoned warehouse in the middle of Melbourne. And they had a camera mounted on the ground, just looking up for this high shot as I get suplexed right into frame. Oh, no. And we were hitting the deck so hard, me backwards on my head, legs folded over, that the camera was, well, the, the ground was vibrating, so the camera was shaking. Sure. So they actually, they actually had to mount the camera on a steady arm rig and set it really low what? so that it took the vibration out. And we did it three more times, and, like, I've probably never been so pumped up in my life. Like, I went <laughs> to the toilet about four or five times because I didn't want to be that stunt guy that got knocked out on set and pissed himself. Yeah. <laughs> the likelihood of getting knocked out was probably pretty high. Sure. And Most people get suplexed yeah, once. <laughs> that's right, and they're done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the prosthetics guys did a great job of – they built a um, polycarbonate skull cap for me that I wore underneath the prosthetic. Oh. So I've kind of got like – an inch and a half of uh, foam latex on the back of my head, that skull cap, and then some padding underneath a leather jacket, and that's all I had to go pull them onto the concrete. Sure. Okay. Okay. That's That mm-hmm. was going to be my next question. I was like, how do you safely take a suplex? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Well, you've got to, you've got to have to trust the other performer. He's got a lot to – Yeah. Lot to, yeah, because <laughs> – as he's driving over, he can actually pull your hips down to take some of the weight onto his shoulder and back, so he's not just oh. driving you in. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. So, mm. so what would you say is the most dangerous stunt you've done so far? Uh, I'll take it back. Being paid to do. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> there's, there's different games yeah. we're playing here. <laughs> that that was probably the one where I had the most fear because I was quite young in the industry sure and i had a lot i felt like i had a lot to prove and yeah that was the one where here it is like it's (laughs) up to me it's not like there's some rig that is going to fail or there's something i can blame like this one's kind of on me for preparation and and position and everything yeah this is your moment to prove you're allowed to be here and you're like suplex i'm your guy (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) oh Dude, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, yeah. There was another uh, funny story. We we're talking about costuming on that and how amazing some of the costumes are that have made. Um, yeah, I doubled double Bill Nye on that film yes. as well. Yes, legend. And he is a legend. And he was only in the city for about three weeks to shoot all of his scenes. Wow. And he came in for the fitting, and he tried on this suit, and it was a handmade, you know, tailored suit that his agent had sent through the measurements from, so it wasn't even measured off him. And he oh. put this suit on and he said, this Uh-oh. is the finest suit that I've ever worn. Like, it's amazing. <laughs> it fits so well. And he was like looking at all the details. He said, who made the suit? And it's this little Italian guy that, has, that you know, hand makes all of his suits in these suits in Melbourne. So then and there, he calls him up and 
tells him this is an amazing suit and he takes him and his wife out to dinner and he was only around for like a couple of weekends and i thought that's yeah. a pretty amazing thing like and he ended up buying the suit after the production oh sweet yeah i just thought what a legend like, yeah that's the yeah. dream though isn't it to get a role and you're like this is not i'm keeping this <laughs> yeah <laughs> I heard that he purchased it, but you never know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's Bill Nye. I mean, yeah, he just walked out wearing it. Who's going to tell him no? <laughs> totally. Totally. Like, it's somebody's job to tell him no. But let's be honest mm. when push comes to shove, are you going to tell Davy Jones he can't have a suit? I'm not. Damn straight. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that's awesome. So then, how did yeah. you get involved? How, how'd you get to Moloch then? Because you, you were Moloch in solo, which is yes. awesome. Big fan. Big fan of the yeah. design and the look. So, how did that come to be? Well, for me, that that started at I Frankenstein because I, I did creature work and I did prosthetics. And yeah. then uh, from I Frankenstein, I did a, a TV film series called Childhood's End with Charles Dance. Oh yes, with the and that was uh, a sci-fi. Corell and yes. yeah, the big demon. Yeah, with yeah, the wings. The big, yeah, yeah, the demon space overlord. Yeah, that's a fun so that sentence. the. Yeah, the, the the prosthetic department from that contacted me again and said, how would you feel about doing a full-blown prosthetic again? But this time it's on stilts and it's literally full body, it's legs, it's arms, it's hands. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was fantastic. And then to work with another legend in the industry, Charles Dance, Charles and that was just Dance. when Game of Thrones had sort of kicked off sure. as well. So I had that experience of, creature performing, I'd done some motion capture stuff, then um, a, a second unit director that was doing solo that had done previews with me on I Frankenstein, he knew that I had done all this creature stuff, so he was like, hey, why don't you come in and meet the creature department? Sure. They might have something for you. And then that's when, yeah, I came in and, and I was originally going to be a stunt double for Moloch. Oh, sweet. Yeah. And I, you know, you say uh, Moloch. Moloch didn't mean anything back then. I didn't know. Sure. I was told he was just this minor character a couple of days on set. And I was thinking, like, oh, I want to be like 10 months as a stunt performer on Star Wars. Sure. But, sure. you know, then, um, yeah, they got me in the whole. The th amazing thing for me is that when I saw all of the creatures and the costuming and the fabrication and what they were doing, and I, I saw that it was all live action it's real they're using animatronics they're not doing yeah. s so much cgi and stuff like this i was like oh my god this is incredible like this it's is real. nothing like yeah yeah it's it's nothing like episode one two and three there was lots of cgi like they're doing sure. live action yeah and then uh with moloch there was a, like nearly a month of getting my head cast building the animatronic around my head Sure. building all the costume around the animatronic, figuring out how all of that is going to work. And then I came in for a fitting to put everything on and, and see what it's like. And I walked into a room and it's quite a narrow corridor with um, mirrors all at one end. Oh, cool. And I get dressed up. They put me on like six inch risers on my feet and they put the head on and I can't see a thing. Like with absolutely <laughs> zero vision. It's pitch black. And it's like having, with all the animatronics of the mouth and the eyes and the armature moving, it's like having your head in a in a bee's hive. It's just... Sure. <laughs> so you can't hear, hear much either. And just before the head came on, about 15 people came into the room, like heads of department, producers, creatives, all this kind of thing. So I was like, oh, wow, like 10, like yeah. pressure is on. Like, yeah. <laughs> I've not tried this thing on and everyone wants to see what Moloch looks like and how he moves and walks and stuff like this. Sure. And they said, just do a walk down the hallway. Uh, and I said, oh, I need somebody to tell me when to stop because I can't see and just make sure I'm facing the right direction as, as I set off. Yeah. And I start doing this sort of like lumbering creature movement, working on this sort of idea of a slug type thing. Yeah. And I just kept on going down until I just smashed into something. <laughs> oh, no. And the, 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 uh, <laughs> the animatronic like boofed into my face and into my oh, mouth no. <laughs> and it actually split open part of the animatronic at the front and I could see a little bit out. Oh, no. And I just saw a figure in front of me and I started apologizing. I put my hand up that had these crazy gloves on 
oh my god i'm so sorry you okay i couldn't see you and i'd run into the mirror and i was apologizing <laughs> to myself it was, you. It was like <laughs> My nose was bleeding, my mouth was bleeding. And it's like, oh, my God, like, what have I gotten myself yeah. into? I'm supposed to be chasing Han and there's, like, right. all this sequence of dogs. Oh like, God. I blew it. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but then from that, I, I, that's when I ended up getting cast because they saw how well, I did some other things. They saw how confident I was to sure. move around. Like, the, there was no inhibition from me from the weight and the restriction of the movement and that kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. So, I, just thinking back, I also did a um, a live tour in North America for Walking with Dinosaurs, which was, came oh, from the BBC TV yeah. series. Yes. Yeah, so there was some creators in Melbourne that actually built this whole arena spectacular of Walking with Dinosaurs, sure. and I was I was the suit captain, and there was. Uh, five suit-sized dinosaurs, which was the raptors, a, a creature called Lillian Sternus, which is another bipedal yeah, yeah. dinosaur, Tom baby Wilson Tyrannosaurus rex. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Tom's a buddy. Yeah. Yeah, uh, awesome. Yeah. So, you know, that's sort of where my world of creature started. And, With the and, way and moving. And yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, and, like, those suits were amazing. It's a company called the Creature Technology Company, and uh, just the, again, like... The, that's where it started for me in like 2005, 2006. Sure. Seeing how these things are made really beautifully, introduction to animatronics, introduction to creature work. And that's where you like create this, you know, creature movement sort of specialization that's served me really, really well in, in the stunt industry. Yeah, I bet. Mm. Man, that's pretty good that they judged you on the walk and not the end of the road. So that's good. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. That's nice. Well, they probably thought, imagine if an actor walked smashed right. into the mirror and his face is bleeding. They'd be pissed, right? Yeah. There'd probably be litigation and everything else. They're like, true, true. Well, like, he seems so to deal sorry. with it, okay? So, like, you can, you can have the job. <laughs> They're watching yeah. you apologize to yourself. You're yeah, like, no, yeah, that'll yeah. work. That'll work. <laughs> Victory through persistence. That's, That's right. All it is. That's right. <laughs> That's the key. If you give up, hmm. you'll never make it. But if you never give right. up, something's going to break eventually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as long as it's not your body. That's right, that's right. And even then, there's like healing time, I think, <laughs> depending. Yeah, yeah, hopefully, yeah. Man, so what? So he was heavy, Moloch had to have been, because he, he's a big dude. He's got like yeah. the head and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, not maybe not so much interestingly enough, but the, the dinosaur suits I spoke about had a backpack system, so you're wearing a backpack that has the weight right. of the head and the tail and everything suspended on your back. So it's sitting on your hips and shoulders. Uh -huh. And Moloch was the same. It was a backpack system. Oh, cool. This armature coming up over the head that supported the animatronic sitting in front. Oh. Yeah, okay. there was actually two incarnations because when um, uh, the original directors on Solo, mm -hmm. When they left and Ron Howard came on, they redesigned the whole animatronic of Moloch because the original incarnation we had the helmet on version, right. which was which was the light version, and then there was the helmet open and the face. There was never this sliding armature or you know, oh. sliding action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when Ron Howard saw what we'd already shot with Moloch, he wanted to see that blast shield kind of close yeah, down. Yeah, the best moment. It's really cool. And, like, when I, I was sort of thinking, okay, it's going to be redesigned. Like, it's going to be basically the same as a few other bells and whistles. Like, it was a complete redesign. They actually changed the sculpt of the face, the way the helmet sat on top of me. Like, it was all completely different. It was heavier. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was less room in there and there was more noise. But just the, the Moloch head sitting on a stand in the creature studio and just watching it open and close and the talking, it was just like, it's amazing. Yeah. Like, that is amazing. Like the, the artist, like the artistry and engineering that goes into that is amazing. I agree. I agree. Yeah. That's cool. Cause I was wondering that as well. Like if that was a practical thing with the, when the sun comes up and then the helmet closes really quick, that's real. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. And like when Molly first appears and yeah. opens up. Yeah. Oh, it's so that, cool. That was all real. Yeah. Dude. So you're completely blind in that. You can't, you don't see out of anywhere. No, they brought, they came up with these video goggles. So it's like a... Oh, that's uh, cool. Yeah, it's kind of like 3D or VR goggles. Yeah. And 
originally had a little camera mounted on the end of Moloch's mask, so wherever I was looking, I could see. Oh, but that's cool. The, yeah, in low light, which like most of Moloch's stuff was shot in low light and then even under ultraviolet light, and the camera doesn't pick up ultraviolet light, so you're just seeing dark blue sure. and like you know, lots of artifacts and it was just a blur the camera moving around i couldn't see anything so we actually mounted the camera to my chest it was a lot more stable sure and that way i knew that i was always facing where i had to be looking and then i had to i had somebody in my ear telling me where my eye line was up and down a little bit left a little bit right cool but then I couldn't walk around. So then we ended up oh. actually just pointing the camera straight down at my feet. Yeah. <laughs> and I started recognizing everybody from the waist down and the shoes that they were wearing. Sure. And that that was my world. And looking in these goggles, looking at people's feet, that's how I was able to navigate through somebody in my ear. Yeah, that's, it was, it was quite the dance. Performers. That's how it goes. Yeah. Man, yeah, I've, hard. I've talked to Derek Arnold about it, and when he did POW and Rogue One, he was completely blind, and they're like, go up, walk to the wall, put this thing on the wall. He's like, you're going to have to tell me how many steps to stop, put my hand up and whatever. It's uh, yeah. That's nuts. So how how many days did you end up doing on with Moloch? Uh, oh, it was months. It turned into months. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, it I was bet. a lot. Yeah, and then... Um, I played a character called Way Dirk, which is a, a Mimbanese character in the yes. Empress Nest game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The so red that guy. was really cool as well. Yeah. That's yes. Cool. Was he hot too? Yes. Because Malik, you got <laughs> servos, you got everything, it's weight, you got to get hot. Yeah. Well, yeah, and we were, the Mother Proxima set is a wet set, and there's actually puppeteers in the water, so that water is heated up. So it's oh, it's like the Mother Proxima that. Spa. Yeah. yeah, like it's like <laughs> you're like in a steam room in there. It's like crazy hot. And I was talking before about the wax finish that they had on Moloch's robe. So it's basically black underneath and it's it's painted in this wax. Yeah. I was there was one I don't even know why I was doing it now that I think about it, but I was standing over the top of a steam vent and it was just blowing up oh, inside no. the robes and I'm like, Oh <laughs> hey. that's kind of Oh, that feels nice. I'll yeah. just hang here for a minute and I'm just covered in steam. And then when I walked out, my robes were black again because it had melted all of the wax oh, off no. it. And costume freaked out. They're like, oh my God, what have you done? Like yeah. running away to get another costume to put on me and all that sort of thing. Just, yeah, I'm it sorry, was hard. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Man, yeah. I never thought, yeah, the water would be heated because there's people in it. You wouldn't want ice cold water and have them try to yeah. puppeteer the little worms. Yeah, and and that's the, the Mother Proxima was was a puppet. That was live action. That yeah. wasn't CGI. I've seen the rig. So like, it's like a giant yeah. crane looking thing. Yeah, nuts. And again, that was a redesign when Ron Howard came on from mm-hmm. an original puppet. And like, I again, I just didn't think the new Mother Proxima would be any different or any more spectacular. But it was amazing. Yeah, the way that it could move, dive, and you know, serpent up out of the water it was incredible. Jeez. That's so cool. Mm. I love when I hear about yeah. stuff like how many people are behind a specific creature. I'm a big fan of creature work. And like, yeah. you know, you're inside of it. You've got somebody else in your ear. You've got somebody else working the animatronics. It's like mm. a team of people for every one person. And then you yeah, get something like, like Proxima. It's like 15 different puppeteers. It's nuts. Yeah. That, but yeah. He, heated pool. Never thought about that. But that's a, that's a, that's a good one. Because you don't want yeah. them like shivering in between takes trying to puppeteer. Proxima. Yeah, that's right. Man. And then so you got to be a, a, a Mimbanese, as as it's Mimbanese. pronounced, I think. Sure. <laughs> They're really, really cool looking. But that's not – that was that a head too? Like was that yeah, a whole big that, thing? Yeah, that was another animatronic head, a smaller face animatronic. So it wasn't set out as, as far, a lot closer. Sure. Um, less moving parts and things like that. And interestingly enough, the Mimbanese are females, or at least my Mimbanese were females. Oh. Uh-huh. Oh, hey. so, so I actually had, I actually had breasts on underneath that costume. You've made it. <laughs> Damn straight. That's right. Yeah. You've crossed the line. Yeah. You can now play anything, Harley. We yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure how I felt about that at the time sure. because it's like, well, then get a super talented female performer and right, they'd, right. Yeah, they'd already had a skull cast of mine. I'd done a previous for them because there was actually going to be a fight sequence mm-hmm. with Han and a Mimbanese. Right. So then in the end, they're like, why don't we just dress Harley up? 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Harley can do it. I've he seen. Can do anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he yeah. will do anything. Yeah, that, that, that's the distinction. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's like he one hundred percent will. So was that with Infus Nest's people, uh, the Cloud Riders? Yeah. Was that? Uh, yes. Did you go to a location in Fort Ventura? Yeah, that that's was an amazing cool. set. That is the most amazing set that I've ever seen. That's awesome, yeah. dude. Tom and Derek were on, and they talked about how there was just a ton of wind. They're like, we're yes. walking back and forth again, pelted with sand. <laughs> yeah, and it, uh, the worst of it is kind of like waist height. So, like, if you've got legs exposed, it gets sandblasted. But um, I was lucky enough to bring my daughter out at the time, and she was oh, five, cool. I think. Yeah. So she was, she was like in, oh, no, the, she's in the blast size. zone for the sand. <laughs> So like, even though Chewbacca is hanging around and like there's all this cool stuff, like she was having a rough time out there. I'm trying to like hide her behind different set pieces out of the way, yeah. not getting blasted. <laughs> yeah. In theory, I thought this was a good idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what was amazing and like it was a really proud moment for me is that I brought my mum out from Australia. Oh, cool. And, yeah, and she got to stay with us in the in the resort we were staying at, and she came out to the set, and she was just blown away. Like she was, you know, a fan of Star Wars and yeah, the originals, and seeing working out here in in that environment, it was amazing. Sure, and then get to see her son, like, oh, he made it. Look at that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. he went. He ran away from college, but you know what? It all worked yeah. out. <laughs> well, I, I I did finish my degree, and I think that's my saving grace. So I, yeah. I did what my parents wanted. <laughs> I got my degree, and as soon as I got my degree, I moved city, I pursued stunts, and that's yeah. right. You're right. I did this for you, mom. Also, yeah, look at Star right. Wars. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that's so yeah. cool. So with the Mimbanese and Moloch, yeah. right? Because they're both yeah. Neil Scanlan creations. Which one yeah. was easier to move in? Because I feel like with an uh, animatronic head, it's got to be difficult anyway. Because you've got yeah. and stuff. Yeah. It, I mean, the Mimbanese had very limited vision in that the sl- it had slots that I could see out of, and they were set quite close together. Ah. So they're actually set on the inside of the Mimbanese eyes, so you're kind of looking you know, between your nose, sort of like a little bit cross-eyed. Yeah. And there's a sweet spot. <laughs> where you can see really clearly and then it's a little bit double vision after that. Um, and and but the thing that I find with those creations is those things can actually be, they give a lot of life and character to the creature. Right. So if, if we go back a little bit to the um, walking with dinosaurs, yeah, of you've got this big neck and a dinosaur head in front of you. There's zero vision straightforward and they put these little um, mesh patches on the side of the dinosaur uh, just in front of the, the legs that we could see out of. So we're actually looking out of the side. And if you kind of stick oh. your head, you can see a little bit forward. But what that would mean is that you would stand profile and you would clock the head around where you're looking and you get this really nice shape of the creature instead of being oh. just looking straight down the line. And that taught me a lot about you know, making the shape and, and working with, with the puppet and when we were doing um, promo shows for Walking with Dinosaurs, it yeah. meant that if you had the head facing one way, like snapping at people, yeah. lining up somebody to attack on the side, then they would have no idea that you're waiting for that moment, then they're not paying attention, and then you can, you know, swing the creature around and lunge sure. at them. I mean, like, it was sort of priceless, but it's the same thing with the Mimbanese. Like, it's got such big eyes, and the idea is that they were going to be this sort of semi-subterranean creatures that they could dig and burrow and they could like hide themselves under the under the ground sure and then they, they would be able to jump up out of the ground and, and sort of ambush attack and that was a, an original thing we did uh the battle of mimban where han first meets beckett yeah and val um so with the mimbanese there's this sort of limited sort of or sort of tunnel vision and it's made feel more like a bird where the movement of the head is really important the direction oh, of looking because right. they're real yeah type of creatures. yeah so, yeah yes yeah so it adds a sort of a nice creature element of you know finding your focus and the way that you move your head is different to just being standing back and just seeing it all you know with the eyes sure but, sure yeah dude, dude i love neil neil scanlon is another <laughs> just legend he's one that yeah, like he's next level it for real his creature designs and i the, the other thing that i love is like the attention to detail with these type of creatures because it's not just like oh he looks cool you know you get stuff Mm. like yeah they're subterranean so their eyes are big and they would move kind of like that like 
it makes it real. You know, yeah. like one of my favorite things is he talks about uh, the show and tells, you know, the fact yeah. that he literally like just creates creatures and then the director yeah. comes along and is like, I like that one. I like that one. I like that one. And it's not just standing. It's like, no, here's them living and then pick which ones you want to live in your shot. It's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. So that's cool. a wild thing. That's kind of like the creatures on parade and like, yeah, he, he expects the m- most out of his creatures and like. Yep. He's determined to like have, you know, the best performers in there doing yep. the best physical, you know, job that they can and um yeah, it was fantastic to work with his team. Sure. Yeah. Sure. For all that kind of stuff and it's it's proud to see uh in you know in film you don't you don't get that immediate feedback that you get with with live live shows. Sure. Sure. And um but but having said that, like, there were some moments with Mollick and, and doing the Mimbanese and, and doing the Emphasis Nest Mimbanese where the creature, um, the the puppeteers of the animatronics and the the creature builders were just like, oh, my God, that was amazing. Like, <laughs> you know, we haven't seen our creatures do that kind of stuff or, you know, like, sure. you know, and they talk to you about that stuff and it's inspiring because they've put so much time and effort and love into these things. It's really, really cool to have that instantaneous feedback. Sure, because they're building, like, yeah. it, to them, it's, you know, like a stagnant prop that they've yeah. been working on for so long, and then they put one of you guys inside, and you're the ones that are the, the human spirit inside of this thing that bring it to life. And it's like a yeah. great full-circle synergy going on with everybody. It's yeah. so cool. So yeah, cool. and we've all got different ideas and about how these things should move and what and what we we should do. And the difficult things with some creatures that you never really see yourself perform from the outside because you're right. on the inside. It's sure, like, it's Blind not like you can have. <laughs> yeah, it's not like you can have a mirror there where you can and you can just walk straight into it. Sure, but yeah. you can't you can't see yourself in that scene. And then with the limitation of vision, it's hard to see playback and all that sort of thing. And originally in uh, Mother Proxima's lair i was doing this sort of hand movement to me it felt like this sort of snaking slithering hand movement and gestures when there was a conversation with mother proxima and neil came straight down and he's like you know all due respect like we want Mike to be like strong and stoic and like you know this unstoppable juggernaut sort of feeling like we don't want that that softness like sneakiness in that sure. in that instance i was like he was really passionate and he's like yeah. you know giving me all, all of this poof, so we sat down after that and had this great conversation about, you know, where he sees this creature coming from and how it's developed and why he's in this position, uh, you know, in the gang so and all cool. of that. And, like, you know, that stuff is priceless. Like, yeah, it's priceless. Dude, I love it. I love it. Because that that attention to detail, it shows, mm, you know. Yeah. Like, the, there was one time uh, Tom and Derek were in the Lugga Beast in Episode 7. It's a big yes. creature thing. And it took seven months of R and D to build that thing, and yeah. Neil talk. The, Derek tells this great story about them trudging through the desert, and it's getting heavy. And Neil was like, seven months, seven seconds. I want seven seconds of screen time. That's what I want." So while they're yeah. trudging, he's like yelling from underneath, "Be like, I want my seven seconds." <laughs> he knows what he's going to get at the back end, yeah. So that's I why it. I, I he love expects it. the best. Which is yeah. why it's which is why it's so good. You know what I mean? Mm, like that, exactly. So yeah. that's a testament to you as well, because if there's a character like Moloch that they've spent forever designing in the animatronics, fabrication, costume, all this stuff, they want someone inside that will equal the amount of work they've already put in to create yeah. a full picture. So that's pretty, yeah, that's pretty neat. Good job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, another another um creature performance that I got to do was King Kong. It was a King Kong the musical. I've seen video of this with the giant yes, it, puppet thing. Yeah, animatronic King Kong. Yeah, it's like yeah. half animatronic, half marionette. So that is now, as of beginning of this year, is now on Broadway, which is amazing. What? Yeah, Killing and that it. kicked off. That kicked off in Melbourne uh, four or five years uh, before that, and we we did like. 12 months in a theater in Melbourne with the show. And it was amazing. Like it was incredible to work on. I was an animatronic operator of the, the head oh, um, what? of Kong. And there was always this, they're not quite sure how they're going to do the voice of Kong. And they, the company brought me in early just to be a presence for Kong in a development workshop. Sure. Um, 
so that the actress had something to work with. And I was reading the script and it says Kong stands up and beats his chest and roars. I'm like, well, okay, I'll just keep that in mind. Like, yeah, <laughs> I could probably roar if I had to. I don't know what they're thinking. Yeah. And then uh, we'd done a couple of weeks of plotting through some scenes and working on some development stuff. And then it came up. So, oh, so we're doing, we want to do a little show and tell for the producers, but what are we going to do when Kong roars? And the sound guy was saying he could bring in his sound desk and, you know, we could set this thing up, we could fire some things. But the director really wanted it to feel like a, a kind of high school musical presentation. He wanted it to be raw and simple and no razzle-dazzle effects. Yeah. So I just kind of said, wow, well, I could roar. Yeah. Give it a go and <laughs> beat my chest. And I remember when we got to that moment and we were, you know, performing to about 20 or 30 people in quite an intimate space and they did have i'm trying to think if they had music playing it was for, for me the scene felt so intense and intimate with the actress and then standing up drew a deep breath started beating the chest slowly as the kong marionette would oh, and i just so let cool. out the biggest battle cry that i could muster <laughs> and tried to hold it for as long as i can and at the end of it he said to set it up kong has just defeated a serpent and oh, he's saved Dan, and he's saved Dan Darrow, and he's but he's been bitten, so he's wounded. He's like celebrating the victory, and then he falls down, and I just blew out the lungs, and I fell forward, and I got really freaking dizzy. And the director <laughs> just jumped up out of his seat, and he's like, "Yes, that's the voice of Kong. That's the voice of Kong. You've got to record that. You've got to play that live. Like that's Kong." And that was a that was actually a, as an as an artist. Uh, I think back those moments and those workshops that I had working with the the original cast of, of Kong and, and Darrow um, as a performer, that was amazing. Like yeah. learning, learning character development, having one-on-one um, developing a show like that. And then Kong's voice is now performed live every single night. Yeah, it is. And yeah, it's pretty amazing. It, it's ran through a voice augmentation system, which was, it took three years to develop by the sound engineer Dude. and it's got like 28 different processes. You can speak into the microphone, but it's not audible at the other end, uh-huh. but it, it picks up all these little nuances in the voice. Like a lot of breath has to blow over the microphone and like all the little guttural growls and things like that. What? And like we had to change the way that I would sort of battle cry raw in the real world to the way that it would work for the microphone and, and for his system. Right. Right. And when we nailed that, man, it was like, you know, El Diablo in the theater and yeah. the whole place was resonating. It's amazing. What? Yeah. That's so, so that, cool. Yeah. All of that, you know, comes together. Sure. Animatronics, creatures, like the the breath is a really, yeah, really big thing, I think, for um, creature and performing because even robotic type stuff, you, you have to give it life. It can't just be this like static thing. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So I guess that's where the craft comes from. I think so too. Uh, and I love mm-hmm. that it was like a, a human moment that you were just feeling it. You're like, uh, yeah. And it just came out yeah. from like a real yeah. place. And they're like, you're right. You know? Yeah. 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 Oh, it's so cool. Yeah. I, I, I got to work with a really cool, uh, um, amazing vocal coach on Kong. And she actually put a scope down my throat and got me to do oh. the roar and the sound effects to see what my vocal folds were doing. And oh, and she gave me all of these exercises and yeah, she showed me how to breathe differently and posture and all this kind of stuff. It was sure. that art. Dude, mm. I love hearing I love hearing when things like culminate. Like the fact that you did capoeira and then that is very physical and very, mm. you know, human. And then you went from there to like doing stunts and it's all very movement based. And then theater with Kong and all this stuff. It's like it all I'm seeing a clear through line here. As to yeah, why yeah. you are where you are. So, hey, yeah, <laughs> that's a service I provide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would have been nice to see that when I was 16. You know, but... <laughs> tell me about it. Yeah. But, but you kept up with it, yeah. like you said, you know, yeah, v- yeah. victory through perseverance. <laughs> mm. Living testament. Absolutely. Man, mm. so like, so what is a big thing, like, knowing all of this stuff, like, what's a big thing that you've kept, victory through perseverance, but like, what keeps you going? You know what I mean? Like when it's, what what, what's in your head that makes you want to persevere? Do you think it's just something that's in you that you're like, you know what, there's something here I have to satisfy, so I'm gonna keep going because it's just there. 
or is it something yeah. you tell yourself where you're like, I need to do this? Yeah, no, I I think I think you're right. Like I'm lucky enough to have a super talented artistic wife as well. She's studying music at the moment. There you go. She was a dancer. She had a dance studio, and she, uh, when I met her, she was doing circus. So like she can juggle and oh, cool. ride a unicycle and do all these cool things things that I can't do. She actually taught me how to stilt work, walk, oh, and got what? me into stilt walking. Right on. Yeah, and it's just like I guess being able to find a way just we, we just keep saying to each other and we still say it now like we're just chasing the dream like when yep. the work dries up and the money dries up we'll move back to australia and we'll settle down and we'll do our thing and we'll move on to the next bit but like we're just going to keep chasing the dream and we can't chase it anymore and that dream go. just keeps evolving you know like yes she's gone to university to study music as a mature age student and she's loving it she's getting all this studio time and wow. you know she's always been a singer and songwriter so i guess it and then for me, it was when I married and had my first kid is when I started getting the most work. And it used to frustrate me because I had so little time and then my workload get got bigger and bigger and bigger. The gags got bigger, the stunts got bigger, like the productions got bigger. Sure. And I just kept thinking like, God damn, why didn't this happen 10 years ago? <laughs> like when I was young, bachelor, ripping stuff out on the street and it was like yeah. not a problem the body would bounce back and yeah. then yeah. <laughs> you know in, in hindsight it's kind of like you didn't have the focus or the discipline sure and when you've got a kid like it's important to provide for the family so you start i guess just focusing more on on you sort of just cutting the fat like the relationships in your life that aren't working out sure you know you, you just physically don't have the time or the energy for them anymore you've got put your focus some, somewhere else, and that's, I guess, where it all kicked off. Sure. And when me. you have a kid, you've got, yeah. like, the fire under your feet where you're like, food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? When you got, you can't be like, I can go a couple of days without eating, and it's fine, it's whatever. But that's right. Like, yeah, the little ones can't. go up. <laughs> yeah. That's next level. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, and then having family, like, and, yeah, like, the young kids, like, that's the inspiration, and, like, they're so damn playful and creative, and you're like, it yeah. reminds you of what used to be, like, what it was like when I started Capoeira or parkour or, or doing stunts, like, the creativity and remembering that and, like, teaching that to them and all that and seeing them develop skills and just think, oh, my God, like, yeah, uh, the world is their oyster. Like, they've got so many more opportunities that than I ever had as a kid in a, growing right. up in a little country country town. Like, yeah, so just it reminds me to be playful and creative because that's the industry that I'm in right. as well. Right. Yeah. And I can, like, jump out and roar at them and they don't <laughs> yeah. get scared anymore. It's like, not bad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, or, as they're or laughing, they see I'm a, the voice yeah, of they, Kong. <laughs> yeah, they see a scary thing on on a movie or a TV thing and they ask if it's me or, you know, oh, really? <laughs> that kind of stuff. So that's kind of cool. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> so so then what, what advice would you give to somebody who wants to get into stunts or creature work or things that you're doing? Uh, I, it, the thing, when I look back, I was frustrated that I didn't take myself more seriously a lot sooner, Ooh. even when I decided to pursue when I finished my degree and then I moved cities to pursue stunt work, mm -hmm. not knowing what that was or what that meant, but I had some contacts that I could go and train with people. I never really took myself seriously or I didn't feel like I did in the sense that to be a professional, you have to work like a professional, like you have to get certification for things. Sure. You have to represent yourself well. You know, you're communicating and, and talking with producers and actors and these sort of things. Like, it's a job for me. Like, stunts and film and, and creature work is a job. And I right. treat it as such. And I'm not just the guy that's going to say yes to everything and please everyone. Like, I'm going to have an opinion. I'm going to say no. And this is, like, sure. my artistic choice. And, like, this is the choice that I believe would be the safest and the best for the production. You know, those kind of things. And it's sort of – it's easy to say that, but, like – you got to be professional. Like you got yeah. to take yourself seriously, and your passion can absolutely like drive you know your your career. Sure. Um, sure. Mm. I agree. Yeah. And your show reel is really really good. Like. Ah, thank so, you. But I've also learned that like with any sort of reel, from an acting reel to a stunt reel, like there's a million right ways to do something, and mm. yours is really really cool. So if somebody right. wants to be a stunt man or any type of thing and wants to make a reel 
do you have any advice for how to go about that? Because you don't just want to show everything. You want to show your best stuff. But do you yeah, think exactly. that, do you think there's a formula to it? Where it's like you want to show this kind of thing? Or what would that be? Uh, I mean, I was lucky enough to do media production at university, so I've edited that show real together. Shout out and... to your mom. See? Yeah, yeah, she that's knew. Right. Thanks, mom. <laughs> yeah. Yes. There we go. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so I I knew I wanted it to be short. I wanted it to be like 90 seconds. Sure. And um, I wanted it to have this kind of like peaks and arcs in it of, of um, sort of excitement and speed and tempo and things. And, you know, I wanted to edit it to a, a music beat, but I also wanted, um, yeah, I wanted to have – sort of explosive fast moments and then and soft moments. And that's kind of difficult to do in, in 90 seconds. Sure. But, sure. Um, yeah, I had a talented sound engineer that kind of put together this soundscape with, you know, some overlays of film quotes and stuff like that in it. Yeah. And I just sort of worked from that. And I had, like I was saying before, but, you know, you've got to cut the fat. And I just had to throw out a lot of stuff that I really wanted to be in there, but it just didn't fit. Yeah. And... Yeah then at the time it's hard to do but then when you look back at it like weeks later months later you forget about all that other stuff because it, as its own entity it, it works nicely and sometimes i think that gets overlooked where people will just put in way too much of them say for instance skydiving like that's a cool thing that a lot of stunt guys do mm -hmm. but you don't need to put much skydiving if any into sure. your stunt show reel because that's kind of like a public domain thing it's not a professional sure stunt per se and it's so easy now to have a really high quality camera and to right. go out there and film a really nice scene so come up with a choreography with your friends come up with a little scene film it learn your craft and and you know we do that uh, as as a stunt industry in australia that actually happens a lot um the guy that i met on that feature film that i did at university he invited myself and another student to come down to film him doing a car explosion uh, oh. where he was sending a car off something called a pipe ramp. Oh. And, and it's just basically like a handrail that comes off at an angle out of the ground and you drive the car at it fast enough and you hit it and it makes the car you know, fly oh, up into the air what? and through the air. Yeah, so I got to see that and he had an explosion going off and it was just set up with him and his friends and guys that he knew in the industry. And, you know, it's a real stunt, you know. There's yeah. lots of preparation that goes in, and I got to see that other side of what stunt work is and how much preparation and planning sure. goes into it. He knew where the camera should be set up to, you know, capture the action. And it made me realise that, yeah, like on my showreel, there's a couple of fire burns in that. That was the same thing. I moved to the UK. They didn't know if I knew how to do fire over here. So I thought I'm going to go out with some guys that I met in the industry here and I'm going to do a fire burn with them to show competency and get to know people and then have a, a cool moment for my showreel. Yeah. So, like, people can do that now. Like, it's, right. it's, it's a lot easier. Like, you start building a little network of people and skill sets. So I think, yeah, new stunt performers need to start doing that more because often – even for myself, like you do all of these amazing things on film, a lot of it never makes it to the film. Or those that right. do, that, that that what does make it through doesn't always fit nicely in your showreel, or sure. it's not as cool as you remembered it. Like right. you thought you did this banging <laughs> badass stunt, and you look at it and you're like, Ugh, "Yeah, that was pretty lame." That's like I don't it. want to show anyone that. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. man, no, that's 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 great advice as well. So. Having mm. done fight scenes and stuff, what is the key to a good fight scene? Because I feel like I'll, everyone has an idea. Of like, okay, I'm gonna go and I'll I'll kind of hit him and we'll do the angle thing and it'll kind of, but it never quite looks right. So, what do you yeah. think sells a fight scene? Uh, definitely camera angles. Yeah, and camera camera movement is Ooh, super point. important. Yeah. yeah, because like shots aren't locked off anymore like we're not working off tripods anymore sure. you know like gimbals and steady cam systems and fly track systems and crane you know flying sure. cameras like there's a lot more movement involved and then definitely the skill set and technique so like great fighters don't make great stunt performers fighting 
And like I was saying before, often actors do a better job at a fight scene than stunt guys do because they put the character into it. Right. So it's a culmination of those skills. Like there's lots of times where some of the teams that I've worked with, I'm not a fighter at by trade. Like, you know, I'm a sort of cup waiter, an acrobat. Sure. Parkour is acrobatics and free running. That's my background. So I'm learning skill sets of weaponry whilst I'm working and I get to work with these amazing teams. And you learn techniques that you would not ever do in a street fight. Right. If right, you ever right, got right. into a street fight. Sure. But it looks and works beautifully in film. And you have to trust in those techniques. Right. And, and Practice. Because it'll feel <laughs> ridiculous. You do things that feel ridiculous. Sure. And um, that's why going out and filming a, a, a showreel for yourself, you start to learn those skills just by doing you know, learning your craft. Sure. And yeah, so. So how often are you, I'm going to ask a forbidden question here. <laughs> sure. In a fight scene, how often are you connecting with somebody? Uh, like, like physically punching and kicking someone and getting yeah. punched and kicked. Is it more often than not? Uh. It, it is more no it's not often like honestly it's it's not it's not often unless there's a specific gag or something that requires that impact so like you know you're taking impact on your arms on your body you can pad yourself up but like you're very rarely taking impact on the face sure you know um that's cool yeah so it's about i guess like we call it just stacking stacking up to camera to to sell the hit and you're like that that's as simple as making sure that the fist is passing through where the camera is. Ah, and, and then you sell it with the... Yeah, with, with that reaction, because depending on the camera, like if the camera's low, you might have to be swinging a lot lower so that you're cutting the line of where the camera is relative to the actor. Sure. Whereas, yes, whereas if the camera is at, is at head height, then you would pass it straight you know, between the two. But then if the camera goes low, you've got to bring the fist down lower. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. You know, and like that's that's like basic basics of, and you know, the could be that you need to follow through with the punch. You might just want to bring the punch to the spot and pull it back. Like, there's so many techniques that 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 great martial artists and fighters don't have. They have to be taught that. So I've kind of come from a different avenue where I learnt that as my base. I didn't learn sure. a specific like Eastern style martial art that I then introduced to film work. I kind of had an acrobatic kicking background that I learned these other skill sets. Sure. Yeah, really... on the job. Dude, I love yeah. movies. Movies are the best. Yeah. I, they they <laughs> really are the most collaborative art form, in my opinion. I mean, you've got yeah. actors, crew, cast, stunt, this, visual effects, sound. Yeah. Sound is a yeah. big part of, like, fight scenes. It's huge. You know, yeah, like yeah, getting the right hit sound. You can be like, oh, yeah. if they get the right sound, you feel it when they get hit. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, when something is like the the visual effects that are added of like powder hitting or like things breaking yes. and then the sound effects, like, yeah, it comes to life. Absolutely. Bold. And the soundtrack. Yes. Like, Dude, yeah. I, I just saw the new John Wick movie. Oh, uh, yeah, I haven't seen that yet. Woo! It's nuts. And it's mm. one of those where you're like, oh, oh, man. And you that do that us. stuff for a living, so that's kind of cool. Yeah, I'm actually working with that team, that stunt what? team right now. 8711, yeah. killing it. Yeah. yeah. Oh. I mean, I yeah, know a few homework. names behind the Damn scenes. Damn straight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a podcaster, Harley. <laughs> mm. You know. You know, I'm just trying, trying my best out here. Chasing the dream, as you say. <laughs> uh, that's right. Dude, this is really fun. I, I'm so glad we were able to, to make this work. Uh, cause awesome. you're a busy guy and you're still alive. So that's cool. You know, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you've been suplexed a bunch of times. You've been kicked in the head. You survived yeah. the battle with Aaron Eckhart and you got some licks in while you're at it. You know, not bad. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> not bad at all. Not bad at all. So before I forget, uh, where can people find you online? If they want to tell you how awesome you are. <laughs> well, I've, I've recently started up an Instagram there you go. Page, yeah. Smart. I've not ever, I've not ever been on Facebook, and that's my first social media that I kind of kicked off on. Okay, so, so all the fakes yeah, are not Instagram. you. 
<laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> I'm pretty low key. There you go. Yeah, for now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Harley Durst on Instagram. Harley Durst on Instagram, dude. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Thanks so much for chatting. This was really, really fun. Yeah, and, pleasure, uh, dude. Anytime you want to come back, you got my info now. We'll figure it Damn out. Damn straight, Brian. <laughs> Thank you. It's been Absolutely. awesome. And. <laughs> Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it is at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites, as well as BrianBalance.com. That is balance with two L's. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. Let them know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. That's right. Just search The Interesting Podcast on TeePublic to get some sweet gear. Also, I've made a Patreon. So if you'd like to support the show and get access to other exclusive shows, you can now do that at patreon.com slash JediBrian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Logan, and Victor. Your support means everything, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.